When I was seven years old, I embarked on the biggest adventure of my life. Just short of four feet tall, I stood quietly, surveilling the airport around me as I took the first big steps of my journey. As my parents left me behind, I was overwhelmed by the sounds of rattling wheels, the smell of recirculated air, and the seemingly endless number of grown-ups running from place to place. Around my neck, I felt the light tug of a lanyard. Emblazoned on a bright red background were the letters U-M, short for unaccompanied minor. For the first time, I was gonna fly in a little plane all by myself. However, I was a little nervous. As I felt tears of anxiety pooling in my eyes, I tightly squeezed my trusted blankie into the folds of my chubby little fingers. I could use it right now. Giving me some temporary relief from my feelings. Immediately, my fear was turned to wonder. My eyes were drawn to the whirling conveyor belts all around me. I watched as people struggled to heave their bags on top of them. As if by magic, they were then sucked into the underbelly of the airport, a black hole covered by some rubber flaps. Where'd they go? I thought to myself. How'd they get from a conveyor belt to where I was going? As I was wondering, I was whisked away to the plane, and when I arrived at my destination, I once again had my eyes drawn to the conveyor belts. But this time, I noticed the reflective silver folds that cushioned the fall of newly arriving bags. I sat down and tried to figure out the mystery of how they got here. I definitely didn't see them on the plane with me, and they definitely didn't fly here on their own. And then I'd solved it. The bags I'd seen before had been loaded onto a bus, driven to this new airport, and were now falling into the arms of their respective owners. <laughs> While my seven-year-old self might have struggled to understand that, plane have, to understand that planes have a cargo hold, he wasn't wrong in struggling to understand how anything gets from one place to another. Every single day, all around the globe, over 100,000 flights take off. Nearly 90,000 cargo ships power through the ocean, and tens of millions of trucks transport goods from place to place. The beating heart of our globalized economy as is logistics, and logistics can be the difference between winning or losing wars, or time-sensitive vaccines saving the lives of millions. Our world is far more complex than people realize. And by extension, even the smallest impacts to the supply chain can truly impact the world. For example, if during the pandemic you tried to purchase toilet paper, you know what I mean. <laughs> As I said, the beating heart of our economy is logistics. And here in the US, it represents nearly 10% of GDP. However, there's a dirty underbelly of logistics. Over 25% of global emissions are attributable to the movement of goods around the world, and solving the environmental footprint of the backbone of modern human trade is necessary if we want to solve the climate crisis. So, what are we supposed to do? Recycle? Bring a reusable bag? Struggle through using a paper straw that melts in your mouth? No, these all suffer from the same collective action problem that results in only 7% of plastic being recycled here in the US. And of that 7%, 95% of it ends up in the landfill anyway. Your plastic cup isn't the ultimate problem here. To be frank, you and I as individuals can't do too much to solve this problem. While choosing three-day shipping over next-day shipping on your next Amazon order does help the environment, I can assure you it isn't solving the climate crisis. However, sitting in front of me are all of you. You represent the leaders of tomorrow and today. You represent decision makers of Fortune 1000 companies, leaders of world-changing nonprofits, and our next generation of intellectual capital. As future leaders, 
you are some of the best positioned people in the world to do something simple. Renew your supply chain. It's not very sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Forbes doesn't feature on the cover people who are supply chain experts. Time Magazine won't write about you because you've changed your supply chain. And me updating my Tinder bio to include passionate about supply chain transformation <laughs> will not get me any more matches. <laughs> However, given the complexified and interwoven supply chains that we live in, even the tiniest change by you as leaders of the organizations that you will lead can have a massive impact. For example, here in the US, idling is about 5% of annual energy use. And there are two companies that have turned this problem into a solution, UPS and Staples. Years ago, UPS instituted a no left turns program that was designed to avoid waiting to cross traffic. It helped them reduce idling and save some money. What they did is they took GPS data, they programmed new routes that kind of took concentric circles to the right, and as a result, they were able to save millions of gallons per fu of fuel per year, equivalent to 20,000 passenger vehicles. Green supply chain strategies are not novel, nor do they have to be difficult. Similarly, Staples did something that reduced the annual energy consumption of their fleet by 20%. You know what they did? They told their drivers to go slower. By reducing their top speed to 60 miles per hour, they were able to increase their fuel efficiency from eight and a half miles to 10 miles per gallon, saving them over $3 million per year. Supply chains are incredibly complex and highly interwoven. And as a result, as I said, these tiny changes can have a massive impact. So what can you do to help? Well, what I want you to do is ask yourself the following question. How can I fix this? And why do we do it this way? And this question applies to the entirety of your organization. The question is, why do we do it this way? And I want you to look at this from the entirety of your organization, from how we choose to source things, to how you choose to transport them, to how you choose to manufacture them, to how you choose to package them, and finally, to how consumers consume them. After that, it's easy. For example, Sam's Club sells their milk in square containers as opposed to traditional containers. It allows, them to, uh, it allows them to package things three times tighter, allowing them to use 60% fewer trucks than they used previously. And in Pakistan, PepsiCo was able to train farmers in sustainable growing practices, allowing their farmers to reduce the water consumption associated with growing by 30%, while at the same time increasing crop yields by 30%. There's no lack of sexy solutions associated with improving our supply chain. However, what all of them sometimes don't recognize is that rather than reinventing the wheel, sometimes we need to work on the wheels themselves. And by focusing on supply chain strategies like this, we can have a truly tremendous impact on the world we leave for future generations. You have the ability to change the world by making tiny changes to the organizations you lead. And by doing things as small as changing the packaging you're using, or maybe shipping with a few days of extra lead time, you can have a tremendous impact on the planet we leave for future generations. My seven-year-old self was obsessed with figuring out how things get from place to place. All I'm asking is that you unlock the same curiosity in yourself and be able to find the tiny tweaks to your organizations that can change the world. Thank you.